We're back looking at conservation and biodiversity, uh, and we'll look at some of the notes behind this and try to look at some of the details, um, listen your syllabus, and try to make sense of some of uh, this information. I hope the case study uh, last time, just looking at the photographs and hearing the story of these mountain gorillas, um, helped understand where we were and where we're going in this uh, unit. So here we go. This next piece, I'm actually going to black this out. Well, it doesn't really matter actually because most of those are questions. But I would like you to actually try to think about this question because each of us thinks about why conservation of biodiversity is important. We all come from it from a different background. Um, and we can revisit the core of our, our top or our subject and we can think about are we an ecocentric person? Are we more anthropocentric? Are we more technocentric? Um, and with that lens, why does uh, biodiversity matter? It matters in each one and, and it can be quite different in each one. One can hold more value in those mountain gorillas, they are profit. If I'm paying a lot of money to go visit them, that's a profit for local people. Um, ecocentrics might say we just need to conserve these species because these species are, are valuable to that environment. That environment needs to be cut off from all human um, interaction completely. So different perspectives, different uh, viewpoints. And I'll leave that for now because we'll develop a lot of these ideas as we continue in this course. Now whose responsibility is it? That can be that's a bit more focused and we can start to get into thinking about things from the local um, to the regional to the global level. And to really really simplify things we're going to just sim separate them into uh, looking at NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and IGOs, intergovernmental organizations. So uh, the IGOs will be things like the United Nations, for example. They're getting money from governments to do their work. NGOs are not getting money. They're non-governmental organizations. The governments aren't paying them and they're not uh, held accountable uh, to government policy per se, but governments will allow these organizations to work in their countries so they still have to follow the rules, obviously. Um, one example is the Legacy Foundation, um, which my parents uh, started many, many years ago, and looking at using biomass to reduce the amount of deforestation. So using biomass from field re agricultural residues, uh, corn husks, wheat husks from farms, and turning that back into a briquette that can be used uh, for cooking, rather than having to chop down wood uh, from the forest to use uh, to cook with, which is uh, a big part of deforestation in developing countries. So that's an example of a, of a non-governmental organization, um, not-for-profit. The money that's generated from this organization goes back into the organization and the um, salaries of the staff and also pays for things like getting out to these places to do trainings and that kind of thing, but the money goes back in. To flip to the much larger scale, the United Nations, for example, um, this would be considered an IGO, intergovernmental organization. And there's many examples uh, within the United Nations. The United Nations uh, is just the umbrella of many different organizations. Uh, some that you may have heard of is UN uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, lots of them up here, UN uh, uh, CDF, there's UNEP, there's UNHCR uh, for refugees, um, many different organizations, uh, very large, large organizations when we're looking at these. Um, pluses and minuses between these organizations is that you get a lot more money to do, uh, implement much grander scale uh, change, if you will, or support. Um, but at the same time, that can also be a detriment. Sometimes there's uh, a lot of politics involved and a lot of bureaucracy involved with these. And I think people who work for the UN would agree with me there that sometimes if you see something that's very pressing that needs to get done, there's many levels that it needs to go through to get done. Um, so a lot of positive because you can do a lot, but there, there's a lot of challenges involved with this. Uh, my mother spent her entire career with the United Nations while my father 
um, spent the majority of uh, his career with uh, his NGO. So I got to see both sides of this, and it's, dinner table discussions were pretty interesting, to say the least. Um, now, looking at some organizations out there, uh, some international conserva uh, con oh yeah, sorry. We're looking at the conventions on biodiversities now, so sorry, switch gears a little bit. And still looking at large organizations out there doing the work to protect biodiversity. CITES is, is one of the larger um, groups out there meeting, uh, is it annually? Uh, sorry if I got that wrong. Um, and CITES will meet to discuss, you get a lot of the leading scientists out there from different countries will meet to discuss uh, what to do, for example, with elephants and uh, elephant trade of, I the illegal trade of ivory. For example, South African countries uh, keep proposing to, to have a one-off sale and sell the stored ivory that they get from poachers and they're storing in these warehouses. It's worth millions and millions of dollars if they sell it. East African countries will say, listen, if we sell that ivory, that's just only going to fuel the demand for people who want more ivory. And there aren't enough elephants out there to feed that demand. So let's tell the world that ivory does not have a value. And in Kenya, they do an annual burn of the ivory to show that this ivory has no value. You should not think of it as a monetary thing. It belongs on living elephants, and that's where it should stay. So very diverging views, both uh, sides, the South African, Southern African countries versus the East African countries, both want elephants. And people involved with CITES from these countries both want elephants to roam freely and large, healthy, happy populations. However, they completely uh, disagree might be a, yeah, in a way it's a good word for it, I suppose, disagree on how we should conserve elephants. And that takes place at CITES. So CITES is, it helps decide what the rules of trade will be with um, flora and fauna around the world. Um, we keep moving now and we'll jump over here. And there's a few standard sort of vocabulary differences we need to separate at this stage. Um, when we talk about species, you often hear uh, these words come up, flagship flagship species, umbrella species, and keystone species. There is a difference between the three. You can have one, actually, that fits every single part of these. But think about a flagship as a flag. Who flies the giant panda on their flag? The WWF. And it, they use it because people will recognize it, and it's uh, heartfelt. We connect with the species. It's beautiful. Um, and we should save this. So they use it as their flag to draw attention, um, as a symbol for conservation. Umbrella species um, are species, I like the example of the spotted owl because it's, uh, I've experienced this when I was in high school in Oregon, in the northwest of the United States. Um, the spotted owl was used as a species to, it was an endangered species because of logging habits going on there, extreme logging in, in uh, Oregon and people discovered that this spotted owl is about to be wiped out. So by conserving the spotted owl, it was also a tool to conserve the forests. To say, let's, it, the spotted owl needs this forest to survive, therefore it's an endangered species under government law, we'll protect it. How do we protect it? We protect the whole forest where it lives. Um, so that is, it's an umbrella species, acts to cover lots of other species around it. And a keystone species would be things like wolves and bears and even bees on that list. Um, they're the keystone, the cornerstone in a, uh, if you think about the keystone in a, in a castle or a big stone house, that keystone over an archway is that one stone that holds the whole archway together. If you take that keystone out, the whole archway crumbles. So keystone species, are essential for food chains, food webs, and whole communities to survive. So you can see how an animal could be a keystone, umbrella, and flagship species in there as well. Um, but that's just to separate the, 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 the three uses that we tend to overlap. I'll share this video, it's a nice one. It's about how wolves actually change 
rivers, and there is some evidence to that um, in Yellowstone National Park. Um, I won't play the spoiler, but I'll share the link to this video. Um, you've probably already seen it. It's quite popular on YouTube. And lastly, we'll look at just two things here, and I'll skip through a few slides to get to these two things. The difference between in situ and ex situ conservation. If you're an IB student and you're looking at doing an internal assessment in biology or environmental systems and societies or world studies, um, in situ and ex situ conservation it, it has a lot of potential here. Um, in situ conservation uh, says you are protecting that animal in its natural habitat, in sight, so in its sight. Ex situ says you're going to protect, protect the animal, but you're going to take it outside X of its habitat, and you're going to put it somewhere to protect it, in a zoo, for example. And there's different cases for each of these. Um, in an ideal world, in situ conservation, that's it. That's all we would need. We wouldn't need zoos to protect the, the gene pools of, of animals. We wouldn't wipe them out to such an extreme to have to protect them at that level. Um, however, that's just not the reality. So just quick examples of in situ conservation in this picture. Um, I took this picture in Terengere National Park of some elephants just walking around in their natural habitat. The national park is well protected um, and it has a river that flows through it that's pretty well managed uh, or protected at least. Um, and so you get tourism moving through on these roads, but for the most part the natural habitat is, is there and these elephants can live in their natural habitat. The area is protected. Um, X C2 conservation, there's a, a few examples in these pictures here. Uh, captive breeding, example of X C2, we take them out and we breed them outside of their natural habitat. Uh, oops, there you go. And botanical gardens, we don't always need to think about animals, so we can think about plants as well. Botanical gardens are an example of X C2 conservation. Seed banks, if you've not heard about seed banks, I'll put the links uh, in below. There's things called the Doomsday Vault, um, where seeds are being protected uh, so we can replant the earth should we need to if there's some major catastrophe. Uh, interesting story that they've actually already used the seed bank in parts of Syria where war has ravaged certain areas where a type of a wheat species was decimated and it was the only place where this grew and they had luckily had stored some seeds and now they've repopulated this area put them back in the ground and now you have this seed growing again where it belongs so the seed bank has worked um, and that's an example of xc2 conservation more on that i'll share the links for for the seed bank below and let me move on we will save some of these activities and then blog uh, for our future classes. However, in the meantime, if you'd like to revisit this, because I buzzed through quite a bit of this, uh, in these videos we move pretty quickly. So have a pause here and go back to topic 3.4 in uh, Cognity and try all those checkpoint questions. You can also go down and do the checklists. They look like this. Um, if you would like to pause the video and have a look at this checklist, go for it. Did you get these from our topic 3.4, conservation and biodiversity? Did I cover these? Probably not. I think I moved a bit quick. Um, but have a look, and I hope things are working out in these videos for you. And let me know if you have any questions, comments, feedback in the comments below. Subscribe, comment, da-da-da-da-da. What are they all say? I don't know. Anyway, okay, I'll talk to you later.